Mr. Jan started to throw me off. She's been sitting over here for how many years and now she's over there? Owen oh, moved back with you? So I don't know if we're mirrored or what. We're moving around. But uh, it's alright. We'll have some uh, something different, a little change, give you a new perspective. And they always say, you know, when you roll into a routine, you should drive to work one day, take another route. Job your brain, think a little harder. But I uh, hope you're glad to be in the house of God on this Sunday morning. I am certainly glad to be here. Glad to be back from Delaware after a nice long trip to North Carolina for the weekend. Very productive trip, but it was long. And I'm glad to be home. It's always good to be home. Amen. Um, let's uh, stand this morning as we open up our service. Let's turn our attention to God. He's the reason why we're here. And uh, it would be pointless for us to come and get together and uh, not acknowledge that God is here among us. It would, would, it would just be a fun club of people getting together and talking and chatting. We could have our, our long little uh, greeting for an hour and a half, but that would not be very productive. So uh, as we open up our service, let's ask God to minister to us personally. And uh, can we do that now? Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask that you minister to us very personally this morning. We ask that you minister by your spirit and by your word, that you will speak to me personally, Jesus. Guide me and direct me by your word. Minister by your spirit. Let me know what it is that I need to do. Show me the right way to live, Jesus. I worship you and I magnify your name. I thank you that you are here in your presence. I worship and glorify you. I magnify you and I lift up your name. You are great and glorious and I worship you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy toward me, Jesus. I praise you and I worship your name. I lift you up and I glorify you, Jesus. You are great and glorious. Praise the Lord.
living inside of us. We magnify you and lift up your name. You are great and glorious. We lift you up this morning. Thank you for your goodness and your graciousness, Jesus. Amen. And he is the living God. I don't know about you, but uh, I, don't, I don't understand. Uh, I don't know that we can understand. But I don't understand how anyone worshiped a dead God. And they used to do it all the time. I, they, they knew that the gods were dead. They worshipped their ancestors. I, I, I don't understand. Why would you worship something that's dead? They can't do anything for you. They can't help you. They can't answer anything. Uh, it doesn't seem very, very useful. It seems pretty pointless to me. But I know a living God who uh, not only lives, but he cares about me. He cares about every, every, every uh, waking minute. And he's not just the God, but he is my Father. And uh, God cares about us. He is our Heavenly Father. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, he not only is, is, uh, is up in heaven, but he's here among us in the Spirit. And uh, he binds us together. And uh, before you're seated, why don't you find a couple of your brothers and sisters from your similar Heavenly Father. And uh, greet them. Tell them I'm glad you are to see them in the house of God.
waiting on the elders to find their seats. Brother Owen's got two more hands to shake, I think. Well, welcome to the House of the Lord Church. It is good to see each and every one of you. Welcome home to those of you that have been on vacation. And of course, we're missing those of you that have left, which of course we can't greet you because we don't see you. <laughs> They're not here. Summertime is a time of travel, and we know that. And uh, again, I extend my request to you. If you are traveling, let us know. That way we don't have to worry about you. We know everything's okay. And that you are simply taking advantage of the time off. But for those of us that are here, welcome. We are so glad to have you in the house of the Lord. And above all, we are thanking the Lord that God has done great miracles. And Sister Beverly Griffin is in the house. Amen. She and Sister Jan have both gone through in close proximity, eye surgery. Sister Beverly's got one more to go. And God is being faithful, ladies. And we're thanking him for that. I'm not saying you've enjoyed everything you've gone through, but I do know that God promised he would not leave us, he would not forsake us. He would be with us always, even to the end of the world. And that is a great consolation, church, to be able to know that whatever we go through, God is going to be with us. One of the mistakes of Christianity is when someone has sold us the bill of goods, that when you become a Christian, you no longer face any trials. If somebody taught you that form of Christianity, and I just very humbly, very quietly, but very affirmatively tell you that is not what the Bible teaches us. What the Bible teaches us is that we will have trials. We will have troubles. But that God will never leave us and he'll walk with us through those troubles. And that's what makes Christianity different. You're going to have trouble. Everybody has trouble. Whether you're rich or you're poor, Whatever your skin color or your gender, how smart you are, how educated or uneducated, does not matter. Everybody has troubles. Everybody has bad days. Everybody has things that happen. But the consolation we have in Christ is that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That our God shall supply every one of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So we have confidence in him. We're thankful that the Lord is being faithful to that. For summer also, if you uh, see, we do have out our new uh, July, August calendar, so you can look at that. And uh, it is generally much less active than is typical. And part of the reason for that is, is we know that you're going to be traveling. Summer's an active time. And the church's activity really swings back in when everybody's home and stuck in school. But you can look at the calendar there, July, August. Um, one of the things that several of you may have noticed that is absent from our calendar, uh, but you've heard about already that I need to address for you, is uh, junior camp and youth camp that is being offered this year at Cape Henlopen uh, in southern Delaware. I need to draw your attention, and for those of you that are guests and visitors, welcome, and you can basically tune out for the next five minutes, all right? So if you're a guest or a visitor and you really don't care about this, Now's a great time to go get a drink of water or use the bathroom. Or, um, I know you're all doing it anyway, checking your text messages. All right. Um, oh, another thing to do is check whether your sound's off on your cell phone. It'll help me preach if your sound doesn't go off in the middle of, of church. Uh, some of you have one of your kids that call you in the middle of church just to make it ring. Sister Betty, is your phone off? You don't even have it. Smart move. You have some scanty kids. Um, that like to do that. If you didn't know that, that's why Sister Betty's gotten in trouble so many times with her cell phone because she doesn't know how to turn it off and her kids wait until precisely when church is in the middle and they call just to be ornery. Now, if you feel bad for your kids, don't. They're just ornery scamps and it's all right. We, we know how to deal with it. Um, for those of you within the church, our child slash youth abuse protection policy which you know that we have had in place for since actually 1997, I believe it is, um, has two purposes, and we operate by it. Number one is to provide for the safety and the security of our children. And number two, and this is one that many people miss with 
a child slash youth abuse protection policy is we also want to provide for the safety and the security for our volunteer staff. There are those of you that come in and you volunteer your time to work with our children, and we want you being able to be protected of false accusation. So we want our children not to be at risk, and we want you not to be at risk. This policy governs the structure of our local church children and youth programs and includes any event that is sponsored or promoted by the church. So we've operated under this policy. It routinely goes through a review. We bring it into compliance with any changes in the law, and we really try to operate in a manner that not only maintains the safety of our children and of our staff, but maintains us in compliance with government laws and also places us in a good place vis-a-vis -vis our insurance company so that they don't come in and have problems and charge us even more money than the insurance companies charge us anyway. The application of this policy to overnight trips where housing is involved is as follows. All children and youth who are eligible for the trip are housed in one of two ways. So over the years, we house them. Any overnight trip, is they are housed in one of two ways. Either all children, number one, and youth are housed separate from adults while still under the supervision of an adult, of adults and in a secure environment. So we separate adults from children, which then precludes the ability for the child to be abused by an adult in any form. And it also precludes an adult from being able to be charged with having conducted themselves in an inappropriate manner. It just simply removes it. Or, number two, in cases where that scenario doesn't work, each child or youth is housed with at least one of their parents or grandparents rooming with them. So there are cases where the housing is such that for security reasons we cannot do it with the adults separate from the children, and there we require parents to be with the child. And obviously you know the security that is covered there, because you as a parent are in our society still by default the one responsible and considered safe until you've proven yourself otherwise. So two scenarios that we have, and depending upon the circumstances, we apply them. So all children and youth house separately from adults where that can be done securely and safely, or children with at least one parent or grandparent. Some of you bring children, you are the grandparent. We understand that there are circumstances where that's the scenario. Due to the housing arrangements of the New Jersey Delaware District Youth Camp and Junior Camp at Cape Penlopen Park, Newark United Pentecostal Church is unable to sponsor or endorse these camps. That is why you do not see them on the calendar. The housing arrangements are not in compliance with our child slash youth abuse protection policy and its application to overnight trips and does not sufficiently, according to our policy, provide for the safety and security of both our children and our volunteer staff. Consequently, what this means is, as parents and grandparents, you are fully responsible for any decision to participate in these events with full exclusive responsibility. You need to take the responsibility if you decide to participate. Now, I do think that that statement, by the way, I will post on the board so that it is accessible to all of you. And I encourage you that if you have any further questions that you come and talk to me personally, this statement will also be provided to our science director and also our youth director so that they understand that we are not um, seeking to not participate, but we simply cannot endorse or sponsor the event. Um, because of operating under what we believe is a safe policy with regard to both our children and our volunteer staff. Now, so that you know, this won't be in the statement, but let me give you a description. The housing arrangements for junior camp are single dormitories, one for men, one for women. There will, however, be a limit on how many adult chaperones are utilized. Therefore, children will be housed with adults, but they will not necessarily be able to be accompanied by the parent or the grandparent. So scenario number two can't be fulfilled. Scenario number one isn't going to be fulfilled. You're not going to be separate, adults and children separate. 
with adults and children together, parents need to be there, need to be present with their child. Um, also, on the last night of the camp, Friday night, the junior camp will then be housed in the same manner as youth camp. And youth camp is, is according to the following, the housing arrangements of that are 15 bed dorms where there are two adult chaperones who are also rooming with the youth. And again, even though I'm glad there's two adults, that's good, you still have them at risk because now you have adults housed with kids and it is not necessarily, in fact, it will not be, in most cases, a parent or a guardian. And so in both cases, now you need, do need to know, church, that I have fully informed and, and interacted with our Sunday school director and with our youth director about this. Uh, I'm unsure, really, of what they're ultimately going to do in the future, um, but I will be transmitting this. This has been thoughtfully looked at, um, and so each parent, what you need to do uh, is consider and take responsibility because we cannot, as a church, officially sponsor it and officially endorse it. And that is why it is not on our calendar, and that is why um, the information um, you will need to go directly. We don't need to interact directly with the district if you plan to go there. You need to take the responsibility for that. All right? Visitors, are you ready to tune back in? Did anybody go get a drink of water and use the bathroom? Again, any questions, don't hesitate to come and ask me. A uh, little housekeeping that I need to be able to communicate uh, to uh, folks with regard to that. Our bottom line goal is, as church, we want to operate in the world in which we live and do so effectively. There is one thing that will destroy a church probably more quickly than anything else in our experience. We watched it over the years. There's the normal culprits of if we leave doctrine, if we leave truth, then obviously we change who we are. Uh, there's also mismanagement of funds. When that happens, of course, that causes a major, major problem. But in my opinion, one of the worst things that can happen is when either actual abuse occurs, and I don't just mean sexual, it can be physical, it can be anything that is inappropriate with regard to the child. When actual, or even just simply the accusation of it, and things are not in order so that both the child is safe and the volunteers involved are safe, it will gut a church. It will never recover. Our society, rightfully so, has drawn a line with regard to abusing children. We are failing, as a society, to succeed, which all the more ups the ante on the line that's been drawn, because we're falling down so many times. We're constantly having to respond to the depravity of sin. The house of God has got to stay on course. We cannot allow anything to get in the way that causes us to move from the place that this pulpit is trusted, and that this house is safe, and in this environment, the Word of God can go forth. And so, we take very seriously uh, not only the policies that are in place, which, by the way, the advisory board works with me in carrying out that, in both the review and rewriting, in writing, all of those kinds of things, but also that we not only have the policies in place, but that we live by them. That becomes even more important. Because you have to live by what you have in the books, how you're going to operate. And so it is with kind of sadness, I was hoping that we could work some things out and that things would be able to be resolved with regard to camps this year, but it has not, uh, at this point, been able to be brought into compliance with our policy. So, Sorry to take the middle of church to do it, but sometimes that's the most effective time period to get to the most people and let you know and give clear communication. And again, so that there's no confusion, I will put the statement on the board as well so you can look at it carefully. If you've got any questions at all, uh, come and ask me, uh, and I will be happy to respond in detail uh, to, to your requests and what, what you have, what questions you have uh, with regard to this. All right? And again, uh, tell everybody, July and August, pick up the schedules. We're looking forward to our picnic that's coming up in August. We're going to have a great time at Brandywine Wine Springs Park. If you don't want to miss the picnic, we're going to have a good time. And then also, uh, just looking forward, you should be seeing in the next week or two, 
friends, community friends and family day card. They're coming out. So get ready to start passing those out and inviting folks to come for September 9th. We're going to have a great time with a lunch on the lawn. If you like air conditioning like me, in the fellowship hall. And uh, we're going to have a great time. Amen, amen. Do I have ushers this morning? I hope I do. I have a mother and a son. Another usher. Did I lose an usher? Oh, there's Arturo. Here he comes. Jordan, how old are you? Sixteen. Connie, you're too old to have a child. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, you're too. You're, you're, yeah, I meant too young. I misspoke. You can get aggravated that way. Yes, you're too young. Yes, that's what I meant to say. I was looking at Arturo. No, I'm kidding. You're too young to have a 16 year old. I still feel like you're 16 and I'm 14. And you were picking on me. She always gets mad at me about that. She's like, I don't remember picking on you. Every 16 year old girl picks on the 14 year old boy. Whether they remember it or not. Anyway, good looking boy. Let's pray. Can we do it? Jesus, thank you, Lord, that we can give. God, we ask for your blessings upon our giving, Lord. God, continue to be in this service. Let your spirit rule. And God, let your will be done in our hearts and our minds. And we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Stand in March smile.
worship You and I praise You this morning. You're awesome and I thank You for the foundation we have in Your Word. God, I worship You and I praise You, Lord. You're awesome, Jesus. And I love You, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. Praise God. Well, we are, as I already said, so glad that you are here in the house of the Lord. Thank you for coming and worship with, with us. And I hope that we got the temperature right. Some of you are enjoying this hot weather. Some of you are not. Sister Thelma, who is from Jamaica, informed me, now this is too hot. I'm right with you, sister. I've been telling you all since the middle of June it was too hot. You all just finally caught up. And for those of you that are going off to enjoy the heat, I hope you haven't already fried your brains. But anyway, we'll leave that to you. You can call me frozen brains. You guys are fried brains. So anyway, it was interesting. My wife uh, pulled one of our old pictures from our vacation, which is taken in February in the middle of snow in Vermont, reposted it on Facebook, and it was interesting. Some of the people who said they still would rather have this 100-degree weather than go up into the snow. I don't understand them, but God bless you. Sweat away. All right. John chapter 4, and I'm going to begin with verse 23. Allow me to set the context for those of you that don't know the story. John chapter 4, Jesus goes to a town of Samaria. Now, the Samaritans were mixed race. They were part Jew, part Gentile. Because of this, and because of being ostracized and set aside, they had come up with their own worship practices. They did not go to Jerusalem. They did not worship at the temple. The Jews did not like them. And so, it was a surprise that Jesus went into that region and into that town of Sychar at all. But he goes there and he sits by a well. It was actually a well dug by uh, Abraham's grandson Jacob. And there he sits. And at a time when you normally do not go to draw water, it was hot, a woman comes to draw water. And there she comes and Jesus is sitting there. He has, I believe, purposefully sent his disciples away. To go and buy food. And as he sits there, this woman comes to draw water. She's alone. In that time and in that culture, you typically did not go alone. You would go in the morning. Many times the drawing of water, in fact, was the woman's duty in that time and age. I'm not saying it is today. In fact, for most of you, you should say it's your duty. It's really easy. All you have to do is turn that really nice knob. And here comes the water. So it's not like it's hard work. Uh, for any of us. But then it was. You had to go to a well. You had to lower down the large bucket into the well. You would fill it, bring it up, and then fill your various vessels that you would carry the water with. You would normally do this together. It would be a time to talk. It would be a time to commune and interact and all of these different kinds of things. But this woman did not do it because we find from later, and I'm going to jump ahead just to tell you, we find from later that this woman was in fact an immoral woman. We don't know the backstory of how she got there, but we do know that she had a number of husbands, and in fact, the one she was with at that point was not even her husband. So she didn't go with the other ladies, and so she was coming alone. And she approaches the well, and here's this man, and must have by his dress, and would have by his dress, indicated clearly that he was a Jew as opposed to a Samaritan. And and, and so she came with trepidation. She wasn't sure why was he here. Why was he sitting at this well. And then Jesus did something very unorthodox. He spoke to her. And then he asked her to do something. And she was just really bum fuzzled by it. He says, can you give me a drink of water? The woman looked at him and said, sir, why are you even talking to me, let alone proposing to drink from my vessel? I'm a Samaritan, you consider me unclean, you consider me an outcast, you consider me somebody you don't want to even have anything to do with. Why would you be asking me this? And Jesus' response to her is one that preachers have preached for a long time. He says, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me to give you a drink of water. 
Well, this even more bum-fuzzled the woman because she looked at Jesus. He's sitting there and he has absolutely nothing to draw water with. So the woman says, how can you give me a drink of water? You don't even have a pot. And Jesus said, I have water that if you would drink of it, you'd never thirst again. Now this woman who had made this trek alone many, many times, who was ostracized in a people who were themselves ostracized. Isn't that funny how we do that? Some of the nastiest forms of prejudice I've ever seen have been done by people who are themselves under the weight of prejudice. That's the nastiness of sin, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, she says, oh, I'd like some of that water. I'd like to skip having to come out here all the time and draw water. I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to avoid that. And so they begin to have this little back and forth about where they should worship. Jesus says you should worship in Jerusalem because we know who we're worshiping. And she says, well, we worship here on this mountain. And they're back and forth. And in the middle of this, in the middle of a very culturally defined world of Jew versus Samaritan, in a world in which Jesus was being thoroughly Jewish, and yet at the same time, He spoke some timeless words of truth. Abiel is going to be a preacher because she's not a deacon. Deacons sleep, preachers start preaching. I love Abiella. She doesn't love me yet, but I love Abiella. She cries every time I speak to her. So I speak to her and look away. For some reason, that helps her out. In the midst of this, Jesus makes the following statements. The time is coming, verse 23 of John chapter 4. The time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. She basically begins to duck out of the argument. She punts it down the road. She says, well, you say one thing, I say another We'll just have to wait for the Messiah to decide it. Verse 26, then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Now what I didn't tell you is in the rest of the story is that the woman, after having had all of this interaction, went running back into the town. And by the time it was over, she brought all the people of the town. She got everybody to come out by telling them, you got to come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Now, I don't know if those people came for pure reasons or not. They might have come to say, man, we know that woman's got some dirt. Let's go find out what that man knows. But the bottom line is, is that whole town came out to hear Jesus because that woman was caught by these closing words. It's time. It's time to worship the Spirit. The God who is spirit is time to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the reason that I know this woman is because I am the Messiah. I do know what I'm talking about. I am the incarnation of the Almighty God in flesh. Christianity has struggled for the balance and typically pick between two aspects of God. One is spirit, and one is truth. People go to church and they say, oh, I feel the spirit. And they sit there, and because of what they feel, they put up with junk. 
That's not truth. Others go where truth may be spoken, and yet there is no spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that twice Jesus affirmed. First, He said the Father is looking for those who will. And then second, He said those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You are in a church, and I declare to you, there is no picking between the spirit and truth. They come together, and you cannot have them separately. They operate together, for without the spirit of truth, you cannot know truth. And without truth, you cannot rightly discern the spirit. I want to say that one more time so everybody's got that. Without the spirit of truth, you cannot discern truth. You will be deceived and you will not understand. And yet with truth, you cannot. Without truth, you cannot discern and recognize the Spirit. For you will be deceived by what the Scriptures call deceiving spirits. So it's a false choice. And Jesus drives it that. It is a false choice to choose between spirit and and truth for the Father, God Almighty, seeks those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. You don't pick between the two. Now, why is this relevant? Because with anything that is in balance, it can get out of balance. Anything that is in balance, it can get out of balance. Because usually balance is finding some place in the middle that has equal of the two poles that are trying to pull it. I never did learn how, Larry probably did, to spin a basketball on my finger. Did you learn how to do that? See, you're more talented than me. I don't know that it's put one scrap of vegetables on your table, but anyway, you're more talented than me. I could never do that. I just finger this. I just couldn't do it. If you're going to spin a basketball on your finger, by use of the spinning function, you're trying to get it with your finger, with the position of your hand, so that it doesn't tilt this way. And it doesn't tilt this way. And with a basketball, you actually got four ways. Because you don't want it to tilt this way or this way. If it goes this way, you get it in the face. Can't go too far. It's got to have equal distance. Where do you worship God? Well, I'm here this morning. That's not my question. Where do you worship God? And what is the balance of spirit and truth? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here to drive anybody away, and I'm not here to solicit or pull anyone. I'm here to speak the Word of God. I try to reach out to people by the visitor's package you've received, by the handshakes you've received, by the warm love that we give to you. That's our part of reaching out to you and say, hey, we'd love to have you a part of us. Today, right here, right now, this is not me talking to you. This is God giving me an anointed message that is to speak to your heart. Ask yourself the question, what is the balance between spirit and truth where you worship? For the Father is still seeking those who will commit to worship Him, who understand they must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Pentecostals understand about the Spirit. We emphasize the infilling of the Spirit. But it is not just the infilling of the Spirit. You must operate in a way that you walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. You must be guided by the Spirit and not guided by your own mind. You have to have the Spirit be in control because the Spirit is never in conflict with truth for the Spirit that is inside of us, the Spirit that Jesus said would come back as the comforter, that spirit is none other than the spirit of truth. Do 
You worship in a place that tells you you need the Spirit. You realize that when we, when you focus on growing a church, when you focus on how many people are showing up in the pews, when you turn church into marketing, marketing has two ways of going. Now, Ben can come and disagree with me. He's a little bit in marketing, but a little later. But in my perspective, as I've watched marketing, it has two ways of going. Number one is you have niche marketing, which means that what you're going to do is you're going to do something so specialized and so unique that you're going to find the people who really want that specialized and unique thing. And they typically will pay more money. And so you target that audience, and you supply them whatever it is that they need, and then you charge a premium price. Your, your, your business is not in volume, it's in price. Then there's another form of marketing, which is that you find the lowest common denominator. You want mass marketing. You want to reach for volume. So you find things that are common across the volume, across the masses of people, and if you can get that marketed, you can charge a pretty low price, but you're going to make a lot of money because you're going to get a lot of customers. Well, I haven't seen a whole lot of churches focus on niche marketing, so I'm not going to really address that this morning. I haven't seen a whole lot of places of worship Focus on niche worshiping. Most church growth focuses on one thing and one thing alone. How many noses did we have here this morning? The assumption being that everybody only has one. That was a joke. Come on, smile at me a little bit. Even if it wasn't funny, humor me. Oh, horrible Sunday. Good Sunday. Based upon how many noses. The problem with that perspective, the problem with that way of operating, is that when you mass market, you go for the lowest common denominator. And you can't grow a church. At least they say you can't. When you make too many demands of people. When you tell them they got to do too many things. So I ask you. Do you worship in a place that is spirit and truth? Because I can't preach to you a gospel different than what the scriptures show us. And the scriptures show us that Jesus died on the cross in order that he could come back as the comforter. In order that he could come back in his spirit. In order that he could live inside of every one of us. And there is no way that you don't want him. You want his spirit. Now let me take you to the next level though. Not only do you want his spirit, you need his spirit. If you have not the Spirit of Christ, the Apostle Paul says you are not His. I'm not here this morning to tell you who you are. I'm here this morning to tell you that the Scripture said, Jesus Himself speaking said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I ask you, how does He come to us? The Scriptures are unequivocal. He comes to us as the Spirit of truth. He comes in His Spirit. Have you received His Spirit? Have you experienced 
what it is that the early followers of Jesus themselves experienced. Jesus told them, go back to Jerusalem. Wait there for the promise of the Father. Because until you receive that promise from the Father, you're not endued with power. You're not different than you used to be. You're not changed and you cannot change anyone else until you've been changed. You must be transformed. You must have newness of life. You must become something that you are not now. This all happens by the Spirit. So do you worship in a place that emphasizes that? But then church, receiving His Spirit is the beginning, it's not the end. Speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives you the utterance, yes, is the evidence that God has filled you with His Spirit and that you have given Him permission to take over your tongue and your lips and to take residence up in your life. But then the question is, do you walk in the Spirit? The question is, are you led and guided by the Spirit? How do you live your lives, not just when you walk in the walls of this place, but how do you live your lives when you walk outside the walls of this place? Do you worship in a place that preaches to you the Spirit. Do you? By the way, I'm not expecting anybody to yell out an answer. So every time I ask the question, I'm not just waiting for somebody to answer me. It's rhetorical. I want you to answer yourself. Do you? The biggest blessing that Pentecost has given to the world. is the praise of the Spirit. But the worship in Spirit always leads you into truth. I'll say it again. The praise of the Spirit is not the same it's not identical with the worship because Pentecost has impacted the world our worship style has impacted the world but God's less less hung up on the worship style than he is on the worship. It doesn't exist anymore, but a few years back, the United the uh, USSR still existed, and the Cold War was still in place, and the Iron Curtain was still in place. And communism was trying to exterminate Christianity throughout Eastern Europe. Christians who were refusing to bend to the socialist agenda and to the Marxist ideology and the extermination of religion as the opiate of the masses. Those people could not attract attention to themselves. They were constantly being surveyed. They didn't have beautiful buildings like this. They did not have the ability to gather in mass. In fact, they usually had to masquerade and cover the various activities with some people outside doing an activity that actually distracted from what was actually going on inside. And you could only stay for a certain period of time and then you would have to cycle out and go away while others came so that no one could get a finger on the whole thing of what was happening. And in that environment, I remember hearing Pentecostal preachers' incredulity. They were incredulous at the power of God that they felt in this little place where people's praise never went above a whisper. Let alone, didn't have drums, didn't have a bass, didn't have a piano, didn't have a B3 organ, didn't have praise singers, didn't have a PA system. Because the KGB was not who you wanted to come walking in that door.
And yet they said there is this, there is this amazing spirit. I serve a God that is not limited by our external cultural expressions. But he's looking for people who say, you know what, God? I'll worship you in your spirit, and I'll worship you in your truth. And the two feed each other. Because as we pursue truth, we get the spirit of truth. And as we worship in that spirit of truth, he leads us and he guides us into all truth. The two work together because they are in fact coming from one God who is the same God, who is undivided, and he is unmistakably himself. He knows who He is. And He's seeking those who say, You know what? I want you more than I want the external trappings of you. So I ask you again this morning. Do you worship in a place? Do you join with people whose purpose is seeking to balance Spirit and truth. By the way, the imbalance does not come from God. God is the most balanced being you've ever seen. Well, technically not seen. My wife and I are working very hard to find a balance between maleness and femaleness. On the best of days, it's tolerable. And on the worst of days, it's nearly an all-out war. I say, preacher, what's wrong with your marriage? Nothing. Actually, it's quite normal. If you don't have that in your marriage either, you might be just having a roommate. I don't have a roommate. That's my wife. And when you roommates go into their opposite corners and ignore one another, Husbands and wives get close to one another, which means they argue and they also make love. And I don't just mean that sexually. I mean they work together. We don't balance this maleness and femaleness. And yet the scripture tells us that God is perfectly all of that. For God is a spirit. He is neither male nor female. I'm not talking about the incarnation because he did come as a male human being. That's a whole other point and I won't preach it this morning. So you got to come back some other time or come ask me about it after church. Can't preach everything in one sermon. He perfectly balances what I and my wife cannot balance. So it should not surprise us just simply using that example to understand that when it comes to balancing within our lives the worship in spirit and the worship in truth that we struggle to balance this. Those who are spirit say, all oh, you truth people, all you want to do is think. Can I inform everybody? Where do you think you got your brain from? What do you think makes you different than an ape or a chimpanzee? Why do you think you have the ability to overrule your feelings where they simply operate by their feelings? Where did where, 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 that come from? Where do you think, Shane? Where did it come from? It came from God. So stop saying that your brain is in conflict with the Spirit. It's only in conflict with the Spirit if you're employing your brain while walking in the flesh. That's your problem. It's not your brain. It's your flesh. It's your broken nature. It's your sinful nature. You're supposed to worship God in spirit and in truth. So no, it's not acceptable to walk into a church and say, man, they got a rocking choir. The preacher don't preach everything that's right, but man, I love the worship. Not good enough. Keep looking. I stood at the back. By the way, church, you did awesome today. 
did great. I stood at the back as we opened up, and I thought, Lordy, have, my, have mercy. This is going to be one atrocious service. You with me, Lil? I know you were thinking. Well, maybe you weren't thinking it, but you were feeling it. I don't know what was wrong. Everything was off. We sounded pathetic. There was no spirit, and I thought, Lord, we are going to be deader in the door now. Now, let me tell you what I do as a preacher. This isn't arrogance. I'm not trying to be rude or anything. But when I sense that, what I do is, is I just start saddling up. Because you do know that even if it's dead when I hit that pulpit, by the time I exit it, it ain't going to be dead no more. Now, that's the bequest of my father. He says, you don't need it to go well. You just get up there and you preach and you preach with the spirit and God will break it up. So I started saddling in thinking, boy, I'm going to have to get working here. It's not going to be easy to preach today. I'm going to have to get all saddled up. It's all right. I've done it before. I'll do it again. Wasn't feeling bad towards nobody. It's middle summer. Some folks are missing. Others of you are distracted. Some of you were late. A lot of you were late. Hey, well, preacher, what's new? Nothing. I'm just trying to see some change here. Let's sto- show up on time or early. Anyway, I'm not trying to tick everybody off. So I'm, I'm back there. Next song comes. I start feeling something. I'm checking off the attendance. I'm singing along. Sister Cherie and Sister Angela moved into the row in front of me, and I... I'm belting out the song, and I thought, oh, these poor ladies. They're having to. I wasn't worried about Tracy. She'd been listening to me belt them out, but these folks are fairly new, and I'm thinking, oh, these poor ladies. I said, well, that's that's their problem. If they don't like it, they can go sit back in their old spot. So I kept on singing, kept on worshiping, kept on enjoying the Spirit of God, and it, it just started moving a little bit. Then Ben took it. Had prayer service, and then the next song coming. Before long, man. You know what, folks? We were singing just as pathetic on the fourth song as we were on the first song. The organist hadn't changed. The worship leader hadn't changed. We had a few new voices in there, but I saw some of you that came in, and you're even more singers than I am. So it wasn't because of you showing up. What happened? What you got to understand about the Spirit is the Spirit is not looking for a production. The Spirit is not looking for excellence in technical aspects. The Spirit is looking for men and women who are seeking, despite their problems, despite their distractions, they're seeking to connect with God Almighty. And when that happens, where two or three, in fact, he said, gather together in my name, there will I be in the midst of them. And when the Spirit shows up, then it's helpful because we are able to feel the effects of the Spirit whereby then that Spirit can lead us and guide us into all truth. I ask you again, where do you worship? Is it in a place that is both Spirit and truth. Don't be beguiled by the wiles of a production. And I don't even mean that people are trying to make productions. I'm not even talking about their intent. I do got to be honest with you as a church. If we ever, now we got a long way to go for this to happen, but if we ever got where we had a really awesome, this is going to be really funny when I say it. It won't be, but y'all are going to go aghast. We had a really awesome worship team. Now, the reason I can say it that way is because um, one out of the three that are integrally involved in that is one of them is my wife. So, I, you know, I'm not being rude. But I, I have a sneaky, I have a little bit of a fear that if we ever get there, how do we go ahead and enjoy the blessings of 
technical proficiency while still keeping the purity of seeking God's Spirit. I've been around when that man was the best preacher there ever was. That's where I'm going, Pop. He ain't all he used to be. He's still good enough, but he's not all he used to be. Years go by, slows down. There's times he searches for a word and he can't find it. Can't remember all your names anymore. Things move along. So then how is it that when he steps to that pulpit and brings forth the Word of God, not as well as he used to be able to, that Kristen still receives the Spirit of God in these altars? Let me tell you why. Because it is not dependent upon our technical proficiency. It is dependent upon people who are seeking to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And both are coming from the Father above. It is all about Him. We just get to participate. So I ask you again. This is a weird service. I've argued with God about this sermon the whole way along. He gave it to me this morning. And I said, God, what am I going to do with that? He said, just get up there. And you're going to know what to do with it when you get up there. And this whole time I'm going, okay, God, now where do I go with this? I am preaching to some people. I don't know who you are. I mean, I can guess because I know some of you, but I do not know who I'm talking to. But I'm speaking to you this morning from Almighty God. And the question is, it is time for you to find a place that worships Him in spirit and in truth. You don't pick between the two. It is not all truth and no spirit. It is not all spirit and no truth. It is both of them in a perfect balance that is not arrived at by human endeavor, but is arrived at because of God Himself Almighty. It is time the Father seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is is time. You have to determine where that is. Because it is in the environment of worship in spirit and in truth that God can save you. Humans don't save you. Your actions don't save you. Except you repent, the Scriptures say, you'll all likewise perish. But your repentance doesn't save you. It simply gives God permission to save you. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You get baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. That does not save you. It gives God permission to save you. For you are saved by grace, through faith, and not of works, not of yourself. It's the grace of God that saves us. So whether you've repented of your sins, whether you've been baptized in Jesus' name, and if you haven't, you should do both. Whether you have received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, everybody in this place, we can never stop until we see the pearly gates worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Because without the spirit and the truth, we cannot be saved. It is by His Spirit that we have the power. It is by His Spirit that we are led and guided into truth. It is through the truth, which is His Word, that we even know what to do. Jesus said this, Sanctify them, Lord, through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. I love it when Pentecostals have a big old discussion about sanctification. Let me tell you how sanctification works. The Word, truth, spirit. We've gotten too hoity-toity. We need to get back to where we were less theological and much more practical. You've got to be in a place where there's spirit and there's truth. And if you're in a place where there's spirit and there's truth, it doesn't matter if you're a Pharisee like Nicodemus or an immoral woman like the Lady of Sychar. doesn't matter whether you're Mary Magdalene or Mary the mother of Jesus. 
same spirit, same truth will save you. And after all, what other reason do we go to church? Looking for a concert? I highly suggest several other venues of professionals who are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce your style of music. If you're looking for a club, what kind do you want? Country clubs work? Knitting clubs work? Have your pick. This is not a club. We're not just here to find human fellowship. Thank God for the human fellowship that we have. But that is not why we are here. We are here because we have recognized that we are broken and we are sinners and we need saving. And in that environment, we say, Almighty God, I need you to move on me. And the Father is telling you today, it is time to find a place where His Spirit and His truth are present. Because in the environment of Spirit and truth, he can save you. It don't matter where you come from. Oh, if I could only tell you the stories of people that are sitting in these pews this morning, not out there someplace else. The debauchery they've come from. The levels of society from the bottom to the top. The incomes, the socioeconomic backgrounds, the education or the lack thereof. Oh, all I got to offer you today, I don't have to offer you a beautiful building. Thank God for this building, but this building is not what this is based on. I have nothing to offer you except the Spirit of God and the truth of God. And both of those working together, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. It doesn't matter what you're experiencing. It doesn't matter what sin is tormenting you. It doesn't matter how long it's been tormenting you. If you will find yourself a place where the Spirit of God and the truth of God are in place, it will will save you. There's no dependence that it cannot conquer. There is no issue it cannot unravel. There is no problem that it cannot address. Your marriage falling apart, you need to be where the Spirit of God is and the truth of God is. You're confused about what's right and wrong, you need to be where the Spirit of God is and where the truth of God is. Dealing with deviance in your sexuality, you're dealing with a misunderstanding of who you are as a person. This is where you need to be. You've been picked on by the world, you've been beat down, and you feel like you're a low life. I'm telling you, this is where you need to be, where spirit and truth are. Find the place where spirit and truth are. Find the place. It's time. Because then that environment, Almighty God will save you. I'm done. This altar's open. Would you come and pray? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, I worship you, Lord. God, I praise your name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. hallelujah. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. By the way, if you haven't repented, you can do it this morning. If you haven't been baptized, we can take care of that for you. The water's there. We're ready for you. If you haven't received the Spirit, all you need to do is repent and then worship Him. When you feel your tongue in your lips getting funny, you feel Him beginning to take that. You have a choice to make. Will you let God take over your tongue and your lips and that funny language, that language you don't understand, come forth? It's that simple. If you've already experienced the Spirit in baptism and you're here today and you're wondering why life's confusing, I'm telling you, you've got to walk in the Spirit and you've got to walk in truth. Jesus, I worship you, Lord. Jesus, I praise your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. God, I worship you and I love you. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. Mm, I love you, Jesus. I love you, oh Jesus. I love you, Lord. You're under the host of Jafara Riyad and Allah Hassi. Hallelujah. Jesus, I worship you. I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, I love you today, Lord Jesus. I love you today, Lord. God, I love you. Today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, I worship you. I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Church, don't take for granted the presence of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah, we're used to feeling Him. Don't take for granted what it's doing in the lives of people who are not used to feeling the Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, I worship You and I praise You, O God. You are awesome, Father. You are awesome. Thank You for allowing us to worship You in Your Spirit and in truth. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thy Word, O oh God, Thy Word, O oh God, is truth. Thy Word, O oh God, is truth. Thy Word. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Nothing can replace Your Word, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Help us to walk in it, Lord. Help us to walk in it, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Thank you for your spirit, Lord, that we feel here today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your spirit that we feel here today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We love you and we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, that's it, church. I don't care what I'm hearing, I care what I'm feeling. Worship Him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It can be out loud or it can be quiet. It doesn't matter, but worship Him. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. He's here for you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There is none like you. There is none like you, oh God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Jesus, I seek you. God, you're not just seeking me, I seek you, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Hallelujah, God. We're just common people with so many big needs, oh God. Your invitation, oh God, we respond to it. God, we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, whatever it takes, oh God, never let us leave this path. God, however you've got to operate, don't let us leave this path. God, let our heart never leave to beat for your presence. Do not leave us. God, we need your presence. We need your spirit. We need your truth. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Jesus, I worship you. Jesus, I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. There's a beautiful presence of the Lord here, church. Entertain it. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Each in your own unique way. But entertain the Spirit. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. 
Hareria shoto koreria rararara setiki. Hareria roroho setiki. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Shotokoreri aradara hasitiki. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We cannot ever lose this rawness. We cannot ever lose this rawness of seeking Him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 To every one of our guests or visitors or new folks, thank you for being here. I hope that you felt welcomed. We want you to feel welcomed. But at the end of the day, it is you and Jesus that got to walk this walk. We're here for you. We're seeking him just like you are. But you got to figure this out. And I believe that there's a God who loves you even more than we do. Who will lead you and guide you if you'll give him ear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Praise God. And church, we need to never lose this environment. It's not produced, it's sought. But we have a promise. Jesus says, those who knock, it will be opened unto them. Those who seek will find. So every time we come to church, we need to be seeking him. Saying, Father, we want you in our presence. We need you in our presence. We need you to do your work here today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Five o'clock is prayer tonight, followed by our 6 p.m. service. God bless you. You are dismissed in Jesus' name.